Good morning. Thank you for joining me today. I've got a really special guest, Dr. Johnson, and I do want to get in his head and learn more about what he does. What, in, what intrigues me with you, Dr. Johnson, is you take an integrated approach. And you're not just, when you're worried about health, you're not just treating the symptoms. You want to find the cause of that. And while we live in different worlds, that's the same approach that I take. And when I looked at your team online, I thought, wow, what a great talent pool you've put together. Yes, I take that exact approach that you talk about because people come with chronic health problems and they've tried all kinds of different medicines. Uh, they don't work. And so you have to find what is the triggering factors. Just as you work with the brain, I work with the whole body. So a lot of it has to do with the environment that uh, we're exposed to, whether it's food, food preservatives, chemicals, toxins, mold. Uh, all those affect your body's function and the brain function. You know, and when I think about, you know, sensitivity to chemicals or the toxicity that just comes from the general world we live in, where it's all around us. And while I don't really deal with that in my practice, there is an area of therapy that you do do, hydrobaric oxygen, that I've really become more interested in. And that's because of a client that I've had. And he's been a client now for probably three years. He was in a very severe car accident, and he was in the hospital for a year. He came out of the hospital, went into rehab for a year, and then started trying to piece his life back together. And when I met him, his, his, his walk, his body just wasn't a flow. It was very disjointed, and he knew that. And he was depressed, and his speech was very, very low-level speech, couldn't drive, couldn't work couldn't do anything and he was in a survival mode and we started doing neurofeedback with him and after four or five sessions he came in he's like Lee you know you I got to bring my dad in to see you and I said well I didn't know your dad was in the car I th I, I'm pretty sure I thought he wasn't and he said well he wasn't he said but you know I'm no longer depressed and he said my dad's really depressed I said well I'd love to see your dad but and as we as we work more and more together his speech got better he has a job. He has a car. He actually now belongs to a Toastmaster group. That's something I encouraged him to do to build his confidence. And about three months ago, he said, you know, Lee, I'm thinking about adding hyperbaric oxygen in. Do you think I should? And I said, I don't know enough about it to make, you know, a valued recommendation. But I said, let me research it. And so I looked into it, and he's very blessed and that he has the resources to do different things. And I said, yeah, I think you should try that. So from the very beginning, he started seeing improvement. And he completed, I think it was 40 sessions. And uh, what's happened over that three-month period or however long it was is I've really seen his self-confidence grow. His presence, his being has really changed. And I was talking to him. He, kn he knows I'm doing this. And I was talking to him. I said, so What's your biggest takeaway? And he's like, you know, my balance is so much better. My gait is so much better. And those are two things that I have never been able to help him with. And he's in his mid-20s. He wants to be a dad. He wants to have kids. He wants to be able to play with those kids. Those two things have made a huge improvement in his life. Is that the type of change that you see? Tell me, tell me more about what you do. Yeah, exactly. That is it. And what hyperbaric does for people, whether it's healthy people or whether it's brain injured or ADD, ADHD, uh, cerebral palsy, uh, crush injuries, it increases the oxygen to the tissues 10 to 15 times. Normally, the oxygen is delivered to your body systems by hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. And so it attaches to hemoglobin and then it releases it as it goes through the capillaries. With hyperbaric, when you're breathing 100% oxygen under pressure, it fully saturates the blood vessels. So the blood vessels act as a conduit for oxygen to all the tissues. You get increased oxygen to those tissues, which creates healing. So like in your traumatic brain person, uh, he had cells in his brain that had been damaged and we call idle cells because they're just sitting there, they aren't dead but they're idle and 
with hyperbaric, you wake those cells up. You get that oxygen there, it stimulates those cells, and then they start to work. So you get better motor function, you get better brain function, you get the different centers of the brain that control your emotions uh, working. Uh, the right and left sides start talking. The limbic system works better so that uh, the have a better overall well-being. Well, you know, you said that you're getting 100% oxygen. What do we normally get? 21% is what we're breathing here today. Wow. And so when we have an enclosed chamber, and these are hard-sided chambers, which is like they use for diving accidents for the bends. Mm -hmm. So you can increase the pressure in those up to three atmospheres of, of pressure. So that's like uh, 66 feet of water. So is it a gradual process, or do you start at one level and work up? It depends on what you're treating. I mean, there's a whole host of things that, that hyperbarics use for. Uh, there's 14 different things that the uh, FDA has approved hyperbaric for. Mainly those are wound care, and okay. it's in diabetics. So it's wounds that don't heal. That, that are so burning, burns? Burns. It's approved for burns. It's approved for acute hearing loss. Uh, it's approved for acute vision loss where you get a, a clot in the artery mm -hmm. uh, w with that. Uh, and it's a, for carbon monoxide poisoning and uh, near drowning. So those are the, the main approved areas. Then there's a whole lot of different areas that are approved around the world and are used around the world to treat people like stroke, like mm -hmm. traumatic brain injury, mm -hmm. uh, cerebral palsy, ADD, uh, crush injuries, uh, that type of thing. Tell it, me a little bit more about the ADD. Well, yeah, ADD is, you know, as you get, your brain gets hyper in different areas. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is whether that is related to a brain injury mm -hmm. or related to, uh, I see kids that are, uh, hyperactive after they eat a meal mm -hmm. and you got to find out what foods they react to uh, a quick story I went down to one of the school districts at their alternative school and they asked me to speak I asked the teachers how many of you know about food allergies and everyone held up their hand and I said well how do you know about food allergies they said well after lunch the kids were tearing up the classrooms <laughs> <laughs> and they they said, know the effect of food allergies. Yeah. And so they took one particular food off their tray, and everything calmed down. Everybody calmed down. They put it back on, and they were tearing up the room again. So they said, we know about food allergy. And uh, we see that a lot in, in that uh, that's one of the things I do. You're asking about my mm -hmm. team. Mm -hmm. uh, I have people that do allergy testing on the skin. Mm -hmm. uh, I have you know the hyperbaric area. Uh, we have people that... Uh, work with nutrition mm -hmm. uh, we have person people that help uh, retrain the thought processes some mm -hmm. and, and then I have a, a speech therapist in my office that helps the stroke patients with uh, regaining their speech and just working particularly with the speech process you know it's interesting because probably my three biggest client group would be ADHD anxiety and depression and, of course, what the way I look at regulation, there's three things that create dysregulation. One is genetics. Brain waves are just as genetic as how tall you are. Two is physical head trauma. And I'm amazed at how many people will say, no, no, I've never had head trauma. And I'm like, really? Did you have a sibling? Or did you learn how to ride a bike? Or did you play a sport? Don't you think everybody's had head trauma? Yeah, most people have, and that they just don't recognize it, and it's not something that was uh, apparent to them uh, growing uh, growing up. I mean, now, like with uh, the autistic spectrum, mm -hmm. they're grouping all kinds of developmental disorders into one group, but or originally we had cerebral palsy, which was birth injury, which is a head injury at birth. Mm -hmm. And then we had other disorders along the way that you could sort out. If you ask and take a good history, you can find out whether the child had problems from birth, mm -hmm. whether they had you know, poor sucking, delayed developmental, 
uh, delayed in crawling, motor movement, motor skills, that type of thing, or whether it was due to something later on that they were affected by. But you were talking about genetics. We know that the environment affects individuals in different ways depending upon their genetics. Uh, it's just the genes are sitting there waiting to be expressed with a certain trigger. We don't know what that is, whether it's, say, gluten genes that predispose you to gluten sensitivity or celiac disease. People have those, and all of a sudden one day they develop a reaction. They say, well, why did this happen? Well, you look at the genes, now we can look at genes and see that they had predisposition and the, the right factors came together. So it could be there all this time, and then just something just triggers it? That, in some cases, that's, that's true. Wow. Well, you know, the third thing that creates dysregulation is emotional trauma. And in my opinion, emotional trauma is more devastating to the brain than the physical trauma because it lives at that subconscious level. And you know that subconscious just goes round and round. That'll work its way up to the top and, poof, I can't deal with that right now. We'll push it down. Do, do, you, have, do you deal with emotional trauma? I do. Uh, but I refer them out to people like yourself to work intensively with those people. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see that. Uh, for quite a few years, we had an environmental unit in the hospital where we'd keep people for a period of two to three weeks and fast them and then mm -hmm. challenge them with one food at a time. Wow. And figure out what their reactions were. Well, we had a PhD psychologist that worked with us there uh, and did a full psychological workup. 50% of those people had been abused as mm -hmm. children. And so abuse, psychological stress, whatever, is a big, big component because it patterns the brain in a way that is really hard for an individual to overcome unless they have help in doing so. You know, think about all those people in the Carolinas. I mean, that that's a natural disaster, I think, can impact more trauma than we ever really think about, particularly for children. You lose your home, you lose your school, your school is closed, you know, you may have to relocate, maybe a parent loses a job, the economic strain, and I, know I think that the emotional trauma is something that it's all around us every day. Oh, it is. And developing a good, healthy self-worth and coping mechanism is very, very important. What I see is like in the flooding and all that, people go back in their homes to reclaim their house. And if it's been a while, mold starts to grow. And we saw that in Houston. Uh, and we see it other places where there's flooding. Unless people take precautions they start breathing in mold, and the black mold creates toxins, which are neurotoxins, which, which affect the brain. And they stick tightly to the mitochondria, which is the energy mm -hmm. mechanism. And so these people have brain dysfunction, fatigue, and people can't figure out why. But it all has to do with a toxin that they breathe in from mold or, or damp indoor environments that they've been exposed to. How long does it take for something like mold to develop? I mean, is it months? Is it weeks? Oh, it's really quick. Oh, uh, is it, it days? Yeah, days. Wow. So if you get, the spores are everywhere. And so if you get a dampness behind your wall or under your floor and it's nice and warm, a good environment, it grows pretty quickly. And that's something that I would never think about. I, left, I have family in the Carolinas, and they live in Southport. They left their home. They went up north and wanted to go back on Monday but couldn't get back. So they will have been gone over a week, and that's something that could be happening right now. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's a doctor here in town in Dallas that uh, had a water leak in his house. He lived by himself, and he was ready to go on vacation. He just said, well, I'll deal with it when I get back. Shut the house up. Four weeks later, his house was not habitable he, oh he could gosh. not live in it it was toxic that's a hard way to learn a lesson it, it really is it is so tell me about what the process is for someone to do the hyperbaric therapy well the process you need to uh see me basically right because uh, it's a medical device so you gotta you have to have a doctor's order mm -hmm. and determine what is the appropriate treatment protocol okay. so i see the patient go through all their history 
make sure we have optimal conditions to do hyperbaric. And what, what does that mean? Well, if you're going to do it like on a, a hyperactive kid or a, a ADD kid or a um, autistic kid, you want to make sure that they're on a good, healthy diet okay. and, and they have proper nutrients. If they're eating like dairy products or uh, gluten products and that affects their brain function, then you're kind of negating some of the process and the healing you're going to get from the hyperbaric. So what about grains? What are your thoughts on that? Well, grains are good, okay. but, but <laughs> you got to know whether you're reactive to them or not. Okay. Because a, a group of people have the genetic predisposition to gluten sensitivity. And so you, we now can figure that out. You do a little mouth swab and send it in and figure out exactly what the genetic makeup you have for gluten sensitivity. And that sounds very easy. Yeah, it is. And then we have blood tests that we do for uh, like dairy and soy and, and then the, all the grains if you want and then some of the meats. But wheat, grains, and dairy are the big allergic factors. Yeah. So to get back, I see the patient. We determine what they want to achieve. Uh, on brain injuries, it takes about 40 hours, as you were talking about, to really get the cells so they start to heal, create new vessels to the area, mm -hmm. and function well. The most dramatic uh, hyperbaric story I have is a man that had been through rehab for three months uh, after a stroke. He was in his 40s. It was an unusual type situation. He said, doctor, I think my left leg is ready to work, but I can't make it work. I've been trying and trying for three months. Put him in the hyperbaric. 30 minutes, he was knocking on the side saying, look, and he's moving his leg. We, oh, that's a great story. Yeah, we woke up the cells. There was yeah. nothing magic about it, but it needed oxygen. It needed that healing quality to regain function. And so, like you were telling about your story, is it helps heal. So the process is, for like brain injuries, it, the traditional way of doing it is an hour of hyperbaric, Mm -hmm. twice a day for 20 days. So that's 40 hours of a hyperbaric. Okay. And that's where all the studies have done. A lot of people uh, end up doing 80 hours, another session later on to gain uh, more function. In those type of patients, as long as you don't have another disease process going on which hinders brain function, what you gain, you maintain. Okay. So, so that's, that's nice. That is nice. Once you create the change, you hold the change. You hold the change. That's great. That is great. So do, does everybody do 40 hours, or is there a, a scale that you use based on what their symptoms are? Well, not everybody does 40 hours. It depends on, but if you're looking at a true traumatic brain injury, mm -hmm. you like to, for, to get in 40 hours on the first time. So you can really judge against the studies how much they've gained and they've gained an optimal amount of, over that period of time. Well, you know, and that makes total sense to me because I tell people that come in and do the neurofeedback and neuromodulation, creating change in the brain is not the hard part. That's easy. Getting the brain to hold the change, that's the hard part. And on the average, people will do, you know, 15 to 20 sessions. Some do more, some do less. But on the average, it does average around 20 because the hard, it's hard to get that brain to hold that new change. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's a healing process. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a changing process. It's just like if you're trying to change behavior, uh, how long, you know, how, <laughs> they say it's what, I mean, yeah. three months to really change behavior? Yeah. I mean, they say it's at least 30 days for people to just incorporate the new ideas in. And uh, so you're in there. Uh, what are you doing when you're in there? Yeah, you're in the chamber. You lie, lie down. Your head's a little elevated. Uh, there's TV to watch. Okay. So you can watch TV. You can play uh, music. Uh, it all has to be external because you're in 100% oxygen. So if you create a spark, we, then it's all over with. You have a fire. Uh, oh. <laughs> and so people come in with no scented products on because they give off volatile organic compounds. 
No, so no cosmetics, no, no makeup. Right, just like you got out of the shower. Okay. And we give you special cotton clothes, mm-hmm. all 100% cotton that you wear, um, and slide in. Uh, you watch TV, you can listen to a meditation tape or whatever, but it's piped in through a special speaker. The TV is on the outside. It's a glass enclosure so you can see out. It's I think that would that would be would make me feel that I wasn't trapped right. being able to see out. So are there any side effects that people experience while they're going through this process? There's very little side effects. Uh, as you're talking about, some people are claustrophobic, but mm-hmm. we can, usually can fix that with a little Xanax or Ativan <laughs> and, and working with them mm-hmm. because uh, a lot of times it's a traumatic experience that they've had while they're a little claustrophobic and you talk them through it and they do well. Uh, side effects typically they do well one of the things if you have a lot of allergies and sinus problems sometimes they have trouble clearing their ears because it's like scuba diving you're 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 going underwater uh, and there's increased pressure so you got to be able to clear your ears but there's little uh, plugs we can use to help you with that Uh, the other thing some people if they do a lot and that's 80 or more hours uh, we experience some distant vision problems temporarily because it changes the lens contour on a short-term basis but it reverts back oh, that's interesting. so, so you, but those are the big things there you read about in the literature oxygen toxicity mm-hmm. which is a seizure that happens uh, no one really knows what that means i deal a lot with toxic people uh, that have been exposed to chemical toxins or mold toxins, mm-hmm. uh, they get seizure type activities when I start to mobilize those sometimes. So you, you just have to be careful of how fast we go. And it has nothing to do with oxygen toxicity because that only occurs in the literature above two atmospheres. And a lot of times we start treating those way below two atmospheres. We know as basic as oxygen and water hydration is, I'm amazed at how little people know about that. And I see you've got a couple of books over there, um, one on oxygen. Well, they're, they're both on hyperbaric. Uh, Dr. Paul Harsh is from Louisiana and has written extensively on hyperbaric and the different uses of hyperbaric. It's called The Oxygen Revolution. Uh, it can be bought online. Okay. And it looks at uh, all kinds of different Uh, medical problems that can be treated like stroke, cerebral palsy, uh, Parkinson's, uh, different brain problems, concussions. Uh, There's a new study out that uh, was done in Chicago on student athletes uh, with three hours of hyperbaric, 90% recovered and were symptom-free within a week where the CDC's says 30% of those have symptoms after a month. Right. So there's that brain healing that occurs. The other book is Hyperbaric Medicine by Hooper. And it's, uh, if you Google that, you can buy the PDF file online. Uh, he's from Australia and has done a lot of studies in, from Australia. Uh, so for somebody that's considering, you know, undergoing this therapy, because, you know, it's like the, the treatment that I do. It's a commitment. You don't come once or twice. You're gonna, for me, you're going to come 15 to 20 times. And for you, it may be 20 to 40 times. But it's for someone that wants to research it. Those would be good references for them to look at? It would be good references. Or you go to my website. There's a host of information on hyperbariccentersoftexas.com. Okay. And so if people want more information, could you give us that address again? Yes, Hyperbaric Centers of Texas. Okay. Just, and was then Johnson Medical Associates is the other one that's associated with it. If you go so to you're w- easy to find. Fairly easy to find. So is there anything that we haven't touched on that you think would be important for people to know that maybe are starting to consider the treatment plant, the treatment modality? Yes, and there's not much out there in the form of a pill or there isn't that really heals tissue amen to that heals brains and so what you do retrains the brains gets those cells to work in 
create man, that neuroplasticity that that healthy way what hyperbaric does is get those cells prepared so that their training can go better and quicker and wake up the cells that aren't working so you get better motor function decreased spasticity in the brain people uh, better thought patterns uh, memory situations so uh, yeah it, it is really helpful and if you're continuing to have problems and had a concussion or had a brain injury or a stroke uh, hyperbaric is is a healing way to do that people spend thousands and thousands of dollars on rehab mm -hmm. and it's necessary but my concept is you got to have an optimal brain to get rehabbed and oh, hyperbaric a, helps get that way and then your retraining all works together so even somebody that just wants to take it to the next level they would benefit from it oh yeah i have attorneys that come in and do it uh two or three treatments once a month or do it once a week just to keep their brain sharp yeah and I, I hop in there you know, <laughs> well it sounds like i need to come <laughs> over and hop in there too sure well thank you so much for joining me today and I encourage you to check out his websites. And of course, you can always find information um, at the Brain Performance Center, Facebook and website where we, put, we have different blogs and, and different information. Again, thank you so much. Thank you, my pleasure.